Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. My name is Estefania Rubio. I am the data manager for the FPQC, and I have with me today Dr. Mark Hudak. He was the clinic. He is the clinical lead for the Paired Initiative, and we will be exploring data collection tools and procedures that are needed for you you to track our Paired Initiative. Um, we want to be, you know, as efficient as we can, and we also encourage you to. Um, have a dialogue with us through the chat box about questions. Um, you know, I think most of you probably attended last week's kickoff session. And so some of the things we're going to review here are going to be reinforcement of, of what you heard um, last time, but we're going to really try to concentrate on the, the data collection, which is really the nuts and bolts of how we assess whether or not the interventions that you will undertake are making headway and um, you know where you can sort of uh, intervene in those processes so um, just to really and, and the other thing is we will be having the coaching uh, sessions with you on a regular basis so that you can uh, bring up your experiences and we can all learn from each other on this we don't have any particular claims that we know the best way to do this and we do understand that how you implement the protocols and also the uh, data collection is going to be very different from place to place. And our hope is that we provided we will provide you with some tools that you'll be able to use or you know perfect so that you can you can do that efficiently um, and submit the data in a, in a way that um, is um, as least as least burdensome as possible. Um, so let me let me start uh, the paired initiative. Um, uh, we're real excited about this. Um, we think this is something different um, for us all, and it's a very important aspect of care. And to remind you that the um, acronym paired uh, was invented by um, uh, Colby Day Richardson, who's very creative with these things, and uh, basically it sort of um, summarizes the idea of bringing the family and the infant together um, in the NICU. A summarization of some of the four domains. Number one, the participation of the family in the care and decision making, our ability to um, enhance the dignity and respect um, of, the, of the family by being very um, appropriately and culturally interactive you know, with the family. Uh, demonstrating that we want a respectful collaboration with them in the care of their infant and then providing timely and comprehensive um, information for the family's education about the uh, progress of their infant and what they need to know to be able to care for the infant after they go home. So just remind you that the the centerpiece quality improvement initiative focuses on skin to skin care. And um, we had to set a primary um, outcome or primary aspiration, and that was a fairly modest one. And that was um, by the uh, uh, time the collaborative gets to June of 2023, that compared to your current baseline, um, each of your NICUs will, as it says here, achieve a 20% increase in the percentage of infants who receive skin-to-skin -skin care from at least one family caregiver within three days of eligibility, which is defined by your own protocols. So that is the primary um, goal. We hope that many of you will see a much more robust response than that, especially those of you who are just beginning to get into skin-to-skin. -skin. And then a um, supplemental aim is that by the same time, the information on the family caregiver surveys that we'll talk about at the last part of the talk will also show some improvement from baseline in how families um, really sort of um, perceive and value um, your efforts to provide coordinated and comprehensive family-centered care in each of these, in these domains. Next slide. And of course, this is the... Um, uh, key driver diagram, and I'll go to the next slide, which sort of highlights some of the potentially best practices um, uh, that are probably, you know, most uh, um, 
uh, important um, or ones that you can most easily concentrate on. So you can sort of see how this diagram flows in terms of the best practices. So you can sort of see here that, for instance, um, looking at the second uh, pink box on the right, you know, if you're able to um, create a more culturally sensitive environment, support of the skin to skin care, um, you know, that sort of gets into um, uh, the secondary driver here, which is, you know, paying attention to every infant and family member as, as important and, and communicating and working with them in a way that uh, respects their cultural backgrounds and beliefs which flows into the primary driver, which is treating everybody, you know, with dignity and respect. And that flows into the aim, which goes into the supplemental um, goal, which is a, at least a 20% improvement from baseline in the perception of the culture. So all of these things sort of line up in those directions. And, you know, we will be assessing um, sort of unit um, performance and family-centered care in each of those four domains. Next slide. All right, so, you know, why do we collect data? Um, as I mentioned before, um, you need to know how you're doing, what's going on, you know, what's happening. You can have an impression of what's happening, but without having some really tangible um, objective information, it's really sort of hard to, um, to sort of move on that. And so this will let you know how you're doing. Um, Estefani will sort of begin going over, you know, what sort of information you're going to get, um, sort of the timeline of change uh, with different things, you know, what you can drill down and look at. And these will, together with the family survey, identify those areas in which you're strong and those areas in which you have opportunity to improve. And it may help shed a little bit more light on what's really going on in your system, right? Um, you know, especially with um, the family survey, um, many of you probably rely on some survey that's given after parents go home with their baby, and the rate of return on that uh, is poor, generally, and it's uh, often a bias sample. What we're trying to do with the family um, survey is to have the families do this the day before discharge, you get a much more larger robust sample and you get better insight as to what uh, is, is going on in your system with respect to how the parents perceive it. So, um, and these data, it's important to say, you will know what, you, what your data are. Nobody else will know what your data are. So, so your data will be um, interpretable within the range uh, of what other hospitals achieve, but no individual hospital will identify to anyone else um, other than yours to yourself. Um, and of course, everything is relative, right? So, so there's no um, uh, judgment that's ever made on this. Um, um, it does give you a chance to sort of see, you know, like I said, where you can improve, where you want to maintain. And um, there are a lot of things um, that we structured in this collaborative, um, you know, coaching calls and other sessions. Um, you know, individual sessions if, if needed or requested by your NICU to work with you and, um, you know, help you through this process. And as it says here, maximize, you know, the learning that goes on in the entire um, Florida system. Next slide. So as I said, you know, you will go through a point before you really get started, we'll be collecting information and that will sort of be your baseline. And then, um, uh, you'll be submitting some data on skin to skin every month, and we'll be able to provide you with, um, you know, tracking those data so you can sort of see how you're doing. Um, if you've ever, you know, looked at these um, uh, quality improvement graphs, um, run charts, you know, things go up, they go down. Uh, there are some things that make uh, performance uh, in, in a particular time better, some things that may make it worse. COVID tended to make it worse, for instance. Um, but the net um, idea here is to focus on the long-term objective, which is, you know, to establish a trajectory over time where you can sort of perceive visually that there is improvement. And then finally, you know, the hope on this is that that going through this is is a is a wonderful exercise that that everybody has pride in what you've done, and that um, you know there are um, um, 
accommodations that everybody makes is because part of the culture um, and that you have ways to sort of maintain, you know, your accomplishments over the long term. Next slide. So these are the, sort of the types of data that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to turn it back over to Estefania. Dr. Hudak, so yes, we are having three types of data collected throughout the initiative. The first level is patient level data, so your infants and a little information in your care, on, on your caregivers. Um, we're asking perceptions about the NICU care for the family caregiver, and that is the auto submission through a survey. And finally, the level, the third level is hospital level data. So the things that you are implementing at your facility to maintain this over time and sustain it, right? So first, let's dive into the patient level data uh, level, and then we are going to go through the other ones. Uh, so within the patient level, data, we're going to collect information on the skin-to-skin -skin care and adverse events during those skin-to-skin -skin care episodes, whether or not the infant is receiving mother's own milk at discharge, and if um, education has been provided for the primary caregiver on skin-to-skin -skin care. So as we review what we will be collecting, I'm going to present to you some of the paper forms that we have created to support data collection. Now, the ideal scenario is that you will be collecting this on your electronic medical record because we know that paper forms are difficult to sustain over time. But if at the moment you are not collecting this information in your EHR and we need to start collecting data for the um, initiative, we ask you that you implement these paper logs within your unit. So the first um, kind of homework we're going to leave to you is to print these logs and go into your EHR and review exactly what is being collected in your EHR and where it's being collected. Um, and the things that are not being collected, then you would need to collect um, in the paper form at the beginning. And then over time, you can work with your IT department to make it part of your EHR. So as you can see, the log um, is set up in a way that you will be collecting each skin to skin care episode once the patient becomes eligible for skin to skin care. And eligibility for skin to skin care is going to be determined by your unit. So that is another thing you need to review early. You need to see what is the eligibility established in your unit for skin to skin care. And you need to determine that date. So from that date on, you will be, you know, providing or um, supporting families in providing skin-to-skin uh, -skin care. And as that happens, we ask you that you record each one of those episodes by date and provide information on all of those, all of these data elements. So now we're going to review them um, a little closer, right? So you have the date for each episode. You're going to record whether or not the patient was on respiratory support and what type of respiratory support the infant was on. So here you can see the acronyms, but basically you're going to tell us if they had a high frequency ventilation, a continuous ventilation, just um, positive pressure ventilation or uh, a cannula, or if the patient didn't have any type of respiratory support for that particular episode. Um, if the infant was connected to any type of line, you will be you know, circling these ones. Um, and if they didn't have any, then none would be the answer here. You would have to record when the skin to skincare episode started and when it ended and who provided the skin to skincare episode, right? Was it the mother, the father, the grandparent, the sibling, or other people? Um, now we are collecting only on family caregivers. So if it was um, a volunteer, a cuddler, it wouldn't, we wouldn't require that you collect that episode for the payer initiative because remember that what we're trying to support is family-centered care. So the idea is that you engage the family caregiver. So it has to be someone that is you know, related to the infant um, that the family determines as family. And the, we, we have received a couple of questions. What about you know, partners that are not necessarily married, that are not necessarily the parent? Um, but if the family determines that this person is part of their family, then we respect that, right? Um, they don't have to be related by, by blood, but they have to be part of the family to uh, be counted as a family member. So um, the other section that is very, very important, and we are also going to collect for each skin to skin care episode, is the type of adverse event. So this is our balancing measure. If you remember from last week, we mentioned that we want to make sure that we increase the skin to skin care provision safely. 
And the only, you know, one of the ways that we can track is to see if any type of adverse event happened during that episode. We want to make sure that those episodes are rare. And if not, we want to make sure that we um, put in place things to make it safe. And so we collect this to make sure that we are not increasing risk. We're not causing harm to our infants, our families, right? And so we are going to be collecting for each episode, same as before, um, if an unintended extubation happened, if there was significant um, apnea, bradycardia, or desaturation that required early termination of the skin-to-skin -skin care episode. Again, that will be per your unit guideline, but it has to be significant enough that it requires the termination of the skin-to-skin -skin care. Um, we're also collecting if there was hypothermia during the event, and again, it would require that you know you had to stop the skin-to-skin -skin care episode. Uh, for hypothermia, we actually have some um, guidelines. Um, the temperature has to be less than 36.5 degrees Celsius at the time. Um, for apnea and bradycardia saturation, that's more difficult to, to just set it on, on stone, but for hypothermia, this is your guideline. And um, the other adverse event we're collecting on is line dislodgement. So was there loss of line, um, a subsequent malfun mal malfunction, malposition of the line during or immediately after the skin to skin care episode? So that is what you will be collecting for each skin to skin care episode. Uh, you can have multiple entries per day. That is completely okay. Uh, if you're using the paper form, you just have to circle uh, the lines or the family member that is providing the care. And we did that to facilitate data collection to make it a little quicker. We really, really ask you that you build this in your EHR as it is best sustainable over time. If your facility uses EPIC, um, we have a treat for you. If, you, if the, you're not collecting all of these skin to skin care um, data elements in your EHR, uh, one of our hospitals that piloted the initiative uh, built all of this in EPIC. So if you use EPIC and you need further guidance on how to use what is already there for the initiative, let us know. We're happy to share the, the flow um, that they have already developed and the packet that is already in EPIC for data collection. Um, and what's most important about, you know, doing all this process is to train your staff so the data is captured consistently in a standard manner. So that is something that we found with our pilot hospitals. In some places, one of these things was being recorded in three or four time places. And so it was very difficult to abstract the data. So you may want to do PDSA cycles to standardize your documentation. That is very, very important. The paper log, if you have to use it because it's not yet in your EHR, needs to be kept at the bedside in a dedicated folder or holder. We really, really encourage you to involve the family caregiver in the data collection plan. Um, we have heard from our parent advisors that this can be a wonderful gift or testimonial of their NICU stay, and that they really feel proud of the ability to provide skin to skin care to their infants. So having a document um, may mean a lot to them. Uh, in some places, they are establishing some programs just to promote skin to skin care provision. They are doing uh, the skin to skin care hero batches for families just to um, encourage them to come to the unit to provide the skin to skin care and to highlight the importance of their care. Now, the second piece that we are collecting for each infant are demographics. And so here you can see that I highlighted this study ID number. We ask that once you determine the infants that are eligible for the PAIR initiative, that you keep track of all those infants. So you're going to start with 001 once you determine the first infant that is eligible for PAIR. And you're going to collect all this information about that infant, right? So birth weight, uh, gestational age, if the baby was born at the facility, or if if it was a transfer, you would uh, establish it here. The date of birth, the date of NICU admission, the date of NICU discharge. And this is important because over time, we want to make sure that there is no change in the composition of the population that we are serving so that the data that we analyze makes sense, right? If we all of a sudden have more preemies, we want to make sure that we know it. Um, or if we have very long length of stays. So to be able to 
um, adjust those rates and to make sure that our data makes sense. We need to make sure that we have this information. So that is something else that you will have to collect for your infants. You will also be asked about the race of the primary family caregiver. So there you have, it can be white, black, Asian, um, indigenous populations, others and knowns, the ethnicity of the, of the primary family caregiver and the preferred language of the primary family caregiver. Um, you may know already this, but we are given a higher focus to determinants of health um, in FPQC. And we, might, we want to make sure that we are providing um, standard care for all our populations. So that's something else that we will ask you to um, submit. So again, sometimes um, our EHR does an excellent job at collecting information of the biological parent. But this is just a reminder that not all infants are going to stay with the biological parent or the family caregiver may not always be the biological parent. So if you, um, you know, you need to, to implement a system where you actually collect all this information on the primary family caregiver, meaning the person that provides the most care for that infant. So just a couple, just a couple things to amplify um, on, on what uh, Stefania said. You may wonder why we um, ask for information um, during the skin to skin counters of ventilatory support and what lines are present. And that is because that's really going to be for, for you um, to track because we're aware that some centers are just beginning their journey on skin to skin and um, they may not be um, enthusiastic at this point about doing skin to skin in babies on ventilators or with umbilical catheters. Um, there are many centers across the country that have figured out how to do this. In fact, there are centers that are well ahead of our centers and that they actually have managed to uh, do skin to skin um, for babies who are on oscillatory ventilation. So um, this is something that will give you a window into your progress as well, because if your proportion of skin to skin counters over time begins to include categories of care that hadn't been present at the beginning, that's another way you can mark progress. Um, the reason, as, as Stefania uh, alluded to, um, that we're collecting demographic information, and some of that you may have to sort of do manually because I found out that not all um, hospital EHRs actually collect data on some of the demographics. Um, sort of by policy. And so those are things that might have to be done sort of at the bedside without going into the um, EHR. Um, but it's really to sort of assess that everybody is equal opportunity for skin to skin care, um, that there is not any sort of a preferential, um, uh, a, you know, giving skin to skin to, you know, one, one population and then not as much to another population. So again, that's something that we'll be able to tease out of the data for you and you'll be able to identify if there are possible issues. So getting to some of these other things here, now we're getting into a few additional measures. Um, the first one here is clearly the date on which an infant is first eligible to receive skin to skin is dependent upon your unit protocol. And so there'll have to be some cognitive effort that goes into determining what that date is. And that date may, is probably going to be different from unit to unit for a given baby. So for your unit, you know, when is that baby first eligible? Um, a lot of the tiny babies may be ineligible for 72 hours because of um, sort of extended golden hour um, um, criteria where, where the decision has been made to follow a protocol where you do the minimal sort of movement intervention stimulation of the baby over 72 hours to try to minimize things like IVH um, and so forth. So um, another unit may have a longer period of time. Another unit may say, well, at the beginning, we're not going to start doing skin to skin on babies who are on ventilators until we get comfortable with doing it for babies who are not on ventilators. So for that baby at that time, what date was that baby first eligible? Because remember, the, the primary outcome is, you know, percentage of babies who receive skin to skin within three days of eligibility by their unit protocol. So that's why, that's why we need that, that date. And then the next, the next slide uh, basically sort of focuses on, um, if we can advance one slide, um, we're asking you to 
count up the number of days during the hospital um, admission that a baby received, um, you know, a skin to skin care episode. Um, and that's going to require sort of either going to your paper form or to your um, EHR and figuring out uh, how many days did that happen. Um, this is something that's important because clearly, you know, if you do a skin to skin on the first day of eligibility and then do, don't do it at all for the next two months, that's a very different quality of interaction than, you know, if pretty much every time the family comes in, somebody in the family is able to do skin to skin. I think that's a that's an important measure to do. Um, and we go to the next slide, you know, obviously this creates some uh, burden um, on being able to figure this out. And we did did a survey um, among the centers that were participating in the pilot to sort of ask them qualitatively, how much effort do you think this would take to come up with this, given the way that you have compiled your data? Um, some places, uh, very few places said minimal time. Um, most said modest or significant time, five to 15 minutes for each infant. Um, being about half of the people and, and significant more than 15 minutes being more than half. So um, knowing that, I think um, you'll be wanting to think ahead of time on how best to document these episodes and how best, how, how best to um, count them up. Um, paper forms have a lot of attraction. Um, they're easy to fill out. There are things that actually um, parents uh, likely who come in and do their skin to skin will want to sort of get credit and they'll want to sort of see that document and they may come to, you know, the nurse taking care of the baby. If that nurse is not at the bedside presently and say, you know, I've, I've done this, um, you know, I, this needs to be filled out so that we can get credit for the skin to skin, especially if they're going to go home with the documentation sort of as a, as a, um, you know, real, uh, memento of, you know, the, the paper page with all the skin to skin care documented on it. So enlist your parents as your, as your um, um, assistance in this. Um, I think they'll be great with that. Okay, next slide. And then um, obviously, you know, one of the things here is that, you know, when parents come into the NICU or even before they come into the NICU, you know, we encourage you to have uh, mechanisms to provide education to the parents. Um, you know, obviously some uh, written handouts or brochures or whatever, or videos that they can look at um, to educate them about this and then reinforcement, you know, after they actually come into the NICU and begin doing this. Um, and in these materials, you know, there are things you can do that will will make your families your partners on this and lots of things you can talk about in terms of the evidence of the benefit of this talking about you know what your specific unit considerations are and when the baby would be first eligible um, and then some um, pictures or videos like i said that demonstrate you know how exactly this is done and shows that it can be done safely and easily um, you know without a great deal of um, uh, fuss next slide this is a very quick note, though, Dr. Kudak. Um, this is uh, at minimal what the education bundle should include. Yes. So we do have some samples of the benefits of skin to skin care. We have some um, vouchers and pamphlets in our website. If you need some examples of um, how to share that information with your caregivers. So, again, that's just something that is available on the website if you need it. There's a lot of stuff in the toolkit that sort of goes over this and some of the videos are available as well. So the point is not to make you reinvent the wheel every time. We spend a great deal of time uh, putting together resources that you should feel free to just take uh, and use and maybe adapt to your unit, okay? Um, we're looking to sort of see if the baby um, was receiving any of the mother's breast milk at NICU discharge. Um, and this is... Um, mother's breast milk. This is not donor breast milk. So, so that's important because part of what skin-to-skin -skin care can do is to um, facilitate letdown and facilitate lactation um, and all of that. So we're interested in looking at that over time. And then the next slide um, talks about, you know, um, you know, is information about skin-to-skin -skin available? I mean, do you have it for this baby um, in a log or it was in the EHR? 
you know, it was or it wasn't recorded or, you know, in case there's no information about skin to skin on that baby, you know, we need to know why. So it's possible baby could have had skin to skin, but if for some reason it wasn't recorded, um, that should be a flag, obviously, um, in terms of, you know, your um, quality um, efforts and so forth. Next slide. And it's the following, you're going to have to tell me when I end here. No worries. So this is just a data collection form altogether. We pissed it out so you could see exactly what we were collecting, but this is all together. And, um, you know, if you don't collect this in the EHR or as Dr. Huda gave you a couple of examples of things that are not collecting collected well in the EHR, such as race, ethnicity and, span, and um, spoken language, um, you may need to use the paper form. So this is just the paper form altogether. If you need to edit it, you know, because you collect some of the things in the EHR and some not, uh, let me know and I can send you the Word document so you can, you know, um, just collect what you need to collect. Um, but this is just the paper form. And this is the skin to skin care log. Remember, we have two documents. One is for uh, collecting information on the infant and the family characteristics. So this is going to be just one for your infant that qualified for paired. Um, and then you're going to have the skin to skin care log where you're going to input multiple skin to skin care episodes throughout the NICU state for that infant. Okay, so I guess I'm back on track here and counting accurately. So, you know, the different steps in doing this, um, preparing for your data collection, um, are look, to look at these forms and sort of see what things are in the EHR, you know, which are not, and then, you know, make some um, uh, plans on how you're going to sort of um, acquire these data so that they can be reported so that at the time of data submission, you're not going back and trying to figure out something that, uh, you know, was best known at the time. Um, so that, that would be critical to have a process for doing this. We are asking, and I think we said this at our um, kickoff meeting, um, this is not something you're going to be doing on every baby. Um, we're asking that you do it for your first 10 babies discharge of the month. So you'll be collecting these data on every baby, hopefully, um, who's eligible. Um, but there's no predicting who are going to be the first 10 babies discharge during the month. So, so that's the sample that we said, let's start with that sample. You know, we think that that is probably going to be representative. We will look over time and sort of see, and, um, you know, hopefully that will be, if it's not, you know, we'd have to sort of talk about it, but we're hoping that 10, the first 10 discharges of the month will, will in general be representative because there's no, um, uh, bias because of this quality improvement effort to uh, make sure that a certain segment of babies gets discharged in the first 10, right? They go home for their own reasons when they're ready. So there really shouldn't be any bias on that account. So the next step is to educate, you know, the NICU nurses and the staff on, on elements that are new um, that might not be in your usual collection processes. And then obviously to make these forms available um, in the unit for all of the infants who are eligible for skin to skin. Next slide. So basically, just to review quickly, eligibility um, is unit specific, um, but it's basically a baby that you anticipate is going to require NICU hospitalization for more than five days, eligible per your guidelines at that time, and those guidelines may change over time, for skin-to-skin -skin care. Um, a baby who survives at least three days beyond skin-to-skin -skin eligibility and obviously has a family caregiver who visits, um, there are some babies um, where there may not be family, unfortunately, who can visit, especially if, for instance, we get babies from Tallahassee in Jacksonville, and sometimes those families just can't, don't have the transportation to come in for the time that they are, you know, in the NICU. So that baby would not be eligible. Uh, next slide. And then, so I talked about the first 10 babies. Um, the expectation is you can begin collecting these um, in April. So you have a month and a half to sort of work out some of the kinks and begin um, uh, doing this. And those April data will be, you know, your baseline data. Um, and so we ask that you sort of get your first 10 discharges in April and um, report them by May the 7th. So you have some time uh, to be able to get that done. 
And then Mark, I think- Mark, can I add to that real quickly? Yes. They need to start collecting the data so it's available in April. So you have a little bit of time, but you still need to collect it so that in April, you can actually submit that data. Yeah, the April data would go in by May 7th or earlier if you want to do okay. that. That's, that's, what I, that's what I said. Sorry, Mark. Okay. So, and then um, um, Estefani is going to go through some of the actual data reporting here, and you'll see what you'll be able to get out of the system. So I'll turn it back over. No worries. And we are looking at a sample of the report towards the end, but just to summarize what we've seen so far, um, the process for data submission um, is first, you're going to have to identify the qualifying cases. So remember, Dr. Huda gave you the criteria for inclusion. Um, so you, you know, once you have your list of infants discharged for the month, you will have to go through the list and see who qualifies. Um, and then you would just limit that list to the first 10 infants that were discharged in the month. Um, and then you would access that skin to skin care log and pair data collection sheet if you are doing um, the paper form. Otherwise, you can just use those forms to collect or abstract that information from your EHR. Or if you have a fancy IT group, uh, they can maybe abstract it for you in a more systematic manner. Um, but basically, that is that is how you would go. You identify the qualifying cases, you abstract the data, or if you have the paper forms, you would take those paper forms and you would submit all that information into REDCap. Once you have a DUA that is fully executed, you will receive the link to the REDCap data portal from me. So if you have worked with FPQC in the past, this is exactly the same process that we do for all the initiatives. The data um, lead gets the link for the data uh, submission, and it basically takes you to a red cap survey um, that mimics exactly the information that we have in the paper forms, and you can submit for each patient. So you would complete one survey per patient. Um, but I can only share that link with you once you have your data user agreement fully executed. So that is, that is huge. That's very, very important that you have in place. Now, if your hospital hasn't done that yet, please do not wait until that is done to start collecting data. You have to start collecting data as soon as possible. Um, you have this month to do PDSA cycles on the implementation of the paper forms or uh, figure out your EHR or, you know, figure out a process to collect that information. Um, and on April, you have to start collecting that information and preparing your data for submission, regardless of that status of, for the DUA. But you need to continue working on that DUA if it's not done. Um, so I can actually share that link for, with you and you can submit the data, but do not wait until that is done because then it gets really, really overwhelming. Um, so for this, the third type of data, we have the auto submissions through the Family Caregiver Survey, and Dr. Fudek is going to tell you about it. Okay, so one of the things that we wanted to sort of um, develop um, for you, um, which is really going to be a, a method that you can sort of more objectively look at your progress, was to um, ask each caregiver, and, and these are these don't have to be just the eligible babies. These can be, you know, any baby in the unit. Hopefully every, every family will have a chance to do this. Um, so there's no, there's no perception that there is a uh, preference in how this is done. But we developed sort of a survey that, that parents can actually do on their um, um, smart instruments, whether it's a phone or, or whatever. And um, we ask that you come up with a mechanism to um, have the family do this, you know, we say up to 48 hours prior to discharge. Um, you know, at some point where it's, you're really, really certain, like 95% probability the baby's going to be going home in the next day or two. Now, we all know how that happens sometimes, that, that something happens and that discharge gets delayed. But if you get to the point, like you think it's the day before discharge, the family's doing their final sort of education and so forth. Um, you know, that's the time to, for, to ask them to do it. We thought that having them do it on the day of discharge was probably not a good idea because there are other things going on that day um, that would sort of make it more difficult. But the day before discharge, you know, maybe even when, you know, if that's the time you choose to do a car seat evaluation on a baby um, while, the, while the family member is sitting there, you know, they could be doing the, um, um, doing that, that survey. 
Um, so it has a several sections. Um, it will go into and ask some information about the family, their demographics, their social supports, you know, transportation issues, you know, all sorts of things. Um, it's basically, you know, they sort of click on a box or, you know, hit on a uh, bullet um, to be able to sort of respond to those things. And you can sort of see here the additional options that we sort of have put in there to for data collection. And again, this is really to sort of look at some of these social determinants and, and also make sure that the um, culture of the NICU um, basically reaches out to every family in the NICU. And that's something that you can sort of look at and see, for instance, if you've got one population uh, of, of parents who, who sort of don't uh, evaluate as well, um, you know, that's something that you need to know and that you can begin to sort of explore why that is and think about how to address that um, and maybe do some um, um, special, special outreach or special uh, procedures to do that. Uh, the survey will be in English, Spanish, and Creole. Those seem to be the three uh, major um, languages in um, the units in Florida. There are many others, but um, we, couldn't, we couldn't do every, every um, language. Next slide. And so here are some sample questions. So, so we put some of these, many of these questions in on, on a Likert scale, um, which as you can see is this uh, scale on top from strongly agree to agree to neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. So here are some questions within a particular domain that are pr probably pretty simple, right? So um, I was with my baby as often as I wanted. I spent as much time with my baby as I wanted. I felt like I was truly my baby's caregiver. You know, that gets into the um, uh, partnership aspect of, of care here. Um, next slide. And here's something about the NICU team. This gets into um, dignity and respect, right? So this is, did the NICU team attempt to understand my family's culture or background? Do they talk to me in ways that respected my family's culture and background? And, you know, do I feel that I was respected, you know, in the same way to the same extent as other families and caregivers um, that were around me when I was in the NICU? And parents are very sensitive observers of these things, as you know. Um, they, they, they very keenly appreciate, um, you know, how they're communicated with, how they're treated compared to, you know, other families. And then families do talk. Um, as you know, together. I mean, they establish bonding and they have conversations and some of those relationships last well after discharge. Um, then at the end, this under the education um, uh, domain, we asked, um, and this is uh, Lelis's um, wonderful idea, um, to basically um, have a more quantitative um, assessment um, in terms of, we asked how well prepared do you feel about these things? And um, they each have a choice of not applicable because for instance, a baby may not go home on medications, um, but from a, on a scale from zero to hundred, and they can actually slide that circle across the, the bar there and leave it at a place and we'll record that. Um, how comfortable do they feel about all of those things? You know, so hopefully, you know, parents will feel close to hundred uh, percent confident about doing these, you know, pretty basic things here. Next slide. So this is the this is the little um, uh, card that we that we we ask you to give to the families, um, uh, basically sort of teeing this up, and you can give this to them multiple times. Um, it's probably a good idea uh, sometime early during the hospitalization to say, you know, as part of our family center care, you know, this is these are the things we're doing. We really sort of want to work with you. These, these are areas that we think are important, you know, and, and at the end of the hospitalization, before your baby goes home, we're going to ask you to, to spend 15 minutes to sort of, you know, give us some feedback on how we've done. So they don't find out about it the first time the day before discharge. That's, that's pretty important. Families may actually sort of remind you the day before discharge then that they want to do this survey, um, which will be helpful. So basically, these are the points here. Um, you know, it's an anonymous survey. We can't identify them unless they put things in the text box um, that will sort of say who they are. Um, but that should be obvious. And um, they don't have to do the whole survey. They don't have to answer questions they don't want to do. 
but you know we hope that they'll be able to uh, take 10 or 15 minutes and give us feedback because that will help us improve you know how we um, uh, work with uh, families who come to the NICU after they go home so next slide and here's the QR code some of you asked about in the chat box um, so basically you just sort of scan this and up will pop your survey um, and there's also a, um, a URL that you can go to on a um, uh, computer. So if they if they wanted some other methodology to sort of bring this up and do it, you know that would be fine. They could take this home and do it. Um, you know, at the night that they, the night before they go um, take the baby home, they can do it uh, somewhere else. Next slide. And. Um, you know, then, um, Estefani, we're going to do this next part or sure. about so hospital level? We have the hospital level data. Um, these are things that you need to establish at your facility to support the project. So these are things like staff education, uh, establishing a skin to skin care policy and the standardizing documentation. So there's a couple of things that we are going to ask you um, every uh, two months, most of the time. Um, so we ask you if you're using the standardized documentation for skin to skin care, and we ask you, you know, are you using the EHR, the paper form or non? Um, we ask you if you have developed an implementation of uh, NICU policy promoting skin to skin care for all eligible infants and family caregivers. We would like that in your policy, you include skin to skin care specifics, but also things about holding, visitation, signage that support the family center care and skin to skin care. So here we're going to ask you if you started already, um, where you are at, so you can tell us if you're planning in place or fully implemented. We have had questions about what's the difference between in place and fully implemented. Um, in place is when you have it, in, you have the written policy, uh, some things are being done, but you know, it's not consistent, it's not Fully implemented. Fully implemented, if the word itself describes it, you are doing everything that your policy establishes consistently. Um, and then the other thing we are actually um, going to be collecting data on is on staff competency training on skin to skin care. care. Um, so you're going to be telling us, you know, if your providers, nurses, and respiratory therapy staff are being educated on skin to skin care. Um, education is very, very important to support your project. If it's not happening, you're going to have a lot of resistance that does not go down over time. It only increases. So educate, education is key. We ask that you do didactic instruction about the benefits of skin to skin care and you do clinical training via simulation, bedside observation or direct assistance with infant transfers. So um, just dedication training for your staff, it's, it's key for the project. I wanted to share with you that we do have a um, protocol and an IRB determination letter that is available for anybody who may need it. Um, this has been useful for teams that are having issues getting their DUA or the data user agreement signed. So if you're having issues, let us know. We can share with you this letter. This determines that we, what we're doing is not human research. And so, you know, sometimes that helps with legal departments that want to um, be a little difficult in getting that data, data user agreement signed. Um, another tool that is available for you is the measure M and greed. Every single one of the measures we are collecting is described in this document. It's available on our website, but um, I will send you an email after this call with all the tools and um, instructions on how to set up your data uh, system if you need it. Uh, so, you know, in, in the measurement grid, the, the biggest idea is that you see exactly what we are collecting, what you're going to get in your reports, how it's being calculated. So you have your numerator, your denominator, and the reason, you know, in the description, you can see what, why we do it and the goal. So I promise you, I was going to show you a couple of things um, for the sample report. This is one of the dashboards that you will receive. So these are just simple, very simple trend lines or run charts that you can see over time. Uh, these are the six main or key measures that we are going to be looking at. So prompt initiation of skin to skin care, prompt initiation meaning within um, three days of eligibility. So then we're also going to be looking at average day of life of the first skin to skin care episode. 
uh, this line is going the way, the wrong way, right? We want this um, actually the right way. We want it to decrease. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, whether or not the infant is receiving mother's own milk at the NICU discharge, the number of days or the percent of days when the skin to skin care lasted at least 60 minutes. Remember that we want to encourage parents to um, provide skin to skin care in long episodes that last at least 60 minutes because then is when the benefits are more substantial for the infant. Um, we're going to be collecting on how many parents actually receive the skin to skin care education bundle. Um, and we really recommend that education starts very early in the admission to the NICU. So remember to, you know, look at the resources that we have online, or if you have some to just have some process to have this education information available for your caregivers early in the uh, admission. And, it, and it's not too early for some cases to introduce this actually before the baby's born. Yes. If, if, you, so, if, you, yeah. if you have time where families mm -hmm. can be receptive and assimilate this information. Absolutely. If you have a family visiting the NICU before um, birth, that, is, that would be ideal. Um, and you have your total unplanned adverse events. We are going to be looking very closely to these adverse events because we have already said we want to make sure we're doing it safely. If you access the report online, which is now an option, um, you can use the slicers on the right to subset this information by race, ethnicity, preferred language, uh, in birth status, gestational weeks, uh, birth weight, right? And you can also see it monthly, which for quality improvement is even better because we want to see those points, how they move. Um, and hopefully you can see substantial improvement over time. So that is information on your hospital alone. Now, if you want to see how you compare to others, we also give you graphs that will allow you to compare yourself to others. Um, this is uh, a color-coded um, box plot. <laughs> so box plots sometimes are not very well understood, um, but the basic idea for box plots is that you organize the rates of participating hospitals in our case from highest to lowest, and you divide them in four groups, right? So you're going to have, we now have 34 hospitals participating in PAIR, so that is about eight hospitals, a little more in each group. So you're going to have each hospitals on each of those color-coded areas. And the color is just, it's just to signal, okay, green is hospitals that have the best rates, right? So for prompt initiation of skin-to-skin -skin care, we want more infants to be receiving prompt initiation of skin-to-skin -skin care. So high rates is best. So for this particular hospital, it's very easy to compare based on what I just told you. They started a little bit above median, and over time they are improving in, and they are getting towards those hospitals that are really providing the best care for prompt initiation of skin, skin skin care. So this is just a very easy way to compare yourself to others. Um, so in your report, you will receive those two things. Okay, so we are a little short in time, so I'm just gonna go very quickly on next steps for you. You need to please set up a meeting and review these data tools and identify what you currently collect in your EHR. You need to review that skin to skin care eligibility and your unit policy for skin to skin care. Um, once you do that, you need to do PDSA cycles for the implementation of the paper forms for data elements that are not collected in your EHR. Or you need to do PDSA cycles to standardize documentation in your EHR. Um, and along with that, you need to start education and engagement, right? So that seems all, to be a lot of things, um, but those are things that are going to set you up for success throughout the next 18 months. So try to schedule them early and try to go through them as fast as you can at the beginning. Uh, we really ask you to plan to attend those coaching calls for March and April and to mark your calendar to start um, submission of that on April, May, right? April's data on May. Um, and and collect, lastly, co collect, please collect complete data the for, <laughs> Yeah, collect, collect data for babies beginning in mission April the 1st, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's all I we had for you. Uh, we would love to take questions. Um, let me see if we have any in the chat box. Let's stop the sharing. Yeah, there's a question about whether or not that wonderful colored, multicolored, um, perspective will be available to every center. 
they have their own dashboards they'll get, but they want to know comparatively that comparative side, how often they'll see that. Yeah, please let us know if the graphs are useful. If they are not, how can we improve them? We, you know, we're quality improvement. We are always open to improve. So if those are not uh, graphs that are useful for you, or, you know, if you actually find them useful and you use them, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. So let me see. Um, there was a question. So is there a certain staff education that needs to be documented or is it the decision of the facility what education they receive? So the only re the requirement that we have is that you share your unit policy with your staff and that you actually do didactic training. So you do bedside observation of the transfers uh, with your staff. We do ask you to collect that. So hopefully you have a way to document um, both the provision of education and benefits of skin to skin care to your staff as well as the training, the practical training. Let me see, we have another question. So Tamara, it says, so if you have an admit in April who does not go home till September as, and is one of the first 10 discharge in the month, you are really looking at all data and this may alter your graph. So we are going by date of discharge for all the graphs. And the reason why we're doing that is exactly why you said, because of what you said, you may have infants that started in NICU in a month and then they are discharged months later. So we're just standardizing by date of discharge. Everything that you are going to receive in the report is by date of discharge. So that you know will help um, a little bit with um, adjusting that. You may have a mix of care that you provided for different months, but because we're getting a sample of 10, that shouldn't be so difficult, so different month to month. And, and Tamara, more to your point, you know, if there are multiple babies whose care spans several months, you know, we have the, have the information, the discrete information on the date of, date of eligibility, the date of skin to skin, the date of discharge, you know, we could sort of parse the data and look at, you know, month by month, you know, what's going on in terms of percent opportunity. So that that's over. Now, I, I don't I don't want to lay that on Estefania. That's more than we've sort of talked about. But theoretically, we could we could certainly look at that because we have all the discrete elements. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. We will be reviewing that data um, many many times throughout the initiative. Believe us. <laughs> uh, somebody asked if the dashboard is just our site or we will compare with other hospitals. Yeah, the dashboard is just for your facility and then you have the color-coded graphs to compare with others um, if you need to. Um, are there other HCA facilities having difficulties getting these into the EHR? We can discuss that in the coaching calls. Um, I know some of them are, um, but some of them have also uh, gotten some good solutions. So, you know, in the coaching calls, that's a wonderful time to pick each other's brains and, you know, try to find solutions. Um, do we know when the coaching calls will be by center? You will be sent an email about coaching calls uh, within the next two weeks. We are still finalizing exactly the day and the time. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have exact dates and times right now, but you will get an email um, with all the specifics and um, the invite for the Zoom call. And if at any point you have any questions, I am very happy to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you. Um, you know, now Zoom is, is one of our, my best friends. <laughs> I get to meet with many hospitals and help them solve issues very quickly through a face-to-face -face call. Um, but yeah, I think those were all the questions. I really hope I didn't miss any. I want to be very respectful of your time. We're, we're a little over the hour. Um, Dr. Huda, did you want to have any closing? No, I think um, everybody's sort of stayed on for the call. We, we maintained the full 50 people throughout the hour, so that's great. And um, this may sound a little intimidating, but really, it, it as you get into it, I think it's easier than you think. And I think the benefits of um, being able to sort of track this and look at how you're doing um, will have will be great for your units. So um, I really look forward to working with everybody. and. Um, you know, trying to help everybody move forward on this um, on this initiative and and do better do better family centered care. So, 
Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon.